Hi folks, this is Dr. Kat Schreier back again for Water and COVID-19, your home and health. And this is one of our live stream updates with uh, one of the top pandemic experts in New York City, Dr. Stuart Weiss. Uh, Dr. Weiss, why don't you give it, or Dr. Sue, ask Dr. Sue is where you can find him on uh, YouTube. Why don't you give us a little quick rundown on, on your background qualifications uh, doing pandemics before pandemics were cool. Yes, Kat, great. Thank you for inviting me back. A second day here. I'm very excited to be chatting with you again. Um, I am a board certified physician in emergency medicine and pediatrics and have been doing um, pandemic planning for 20 plus years. Before it was really cool, we were doing lots of work back in the day because remember, Kat, that although some people find that this is, oh my God, I've never expected us there to be a pandemic. Those of us that, that do public health planning have been waiting for the pandemic for years and years. We were actually overdue based on how often we see pandemics. And this is not a surprise. People have been doing, smart people have been looking at this problem for a really long time. Now, go off trip a little bit. So the difference between this kind of pandemic and say the bird flu, the, all the other flus that have been out there. Well, Every pandemic is related to the disease that's actually spreading, right? So um, the problem that we have, so we can't really compare this to influenza. COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19, which is SARS-CoV-2, um, has a specific unique characteristic. It's the way it spreads, the infectivity, the mechanism it uses to spread, and the symptoms that it causes. So we were expecting a pandemic, we didn't know exactly what kind was gonna happen, but this is not unusual in the history of humanity. Um, if you go back in history throughout the, the Bible and Middle Ages and you know, throughout modern history, um, every hundred years, more or less, there has been some type of pandemic. Right, right. I mean, I mean we're talking like Black Death scale and, and just, you know, really just decimating populations and, and certainly yeah, yeah. specific populations in the US we've seen in the Native American population, black population, Hispanic population, yeah. uh, you know, in particular. Um, let me ask you, uh, uh, so you've just come from, uh, virtually, um, the mayor's office, uh, New York City Mayor uh, de Blasio. What's new in the Big Apple? So um, we have a task force in the mayor's office that I'm part of that is working actively on reopening New York. So we're dealing with this particular task force has been looking at special events and cultural events and things that happen that make this city one of the greatest cities in the world um, or the greatest city in the world. Um, so um, we're working very hard to um, come up with the, how do we restart cultural and physical and, and uh, races and concerts and music. You know, it's gonna be a long time before this happens. Um, New York City and New York State are going through different phases, but we just want to, you know, the task force was brought together to be proactive. So it's a very good proactive group with a representation from a broad variety of folks that are involved in, uh, in those activities. Right. And, and you had actually already, even before this had started, created something called Intelligent Crowd Solutions and we're working as a runner, as someone who's involved in marathons and things like that. Uh, you know, and, and I grew up outside of New York City, and I've also been involved in sporting events, and that you know, all the logistics around that, and the responsibility of the organizers for caring for the people who show up for the event, the spectators, everyone else who's involved, right? Yes, yes. So, so I'm the CEO of Intelligent Crowd Solutions, and we actually um, specialize in the medical health and safety for large groups of people. Because there's a real science to the way you move people through gates and you move them upstairs. And there's, there's a real ways to handle crowd safety. There's real ways to think about how do you take care of sick people, large groups of people. Um, event medicine is actually a, a specialty. I'm actually right now the, the head of event medicine section in the American College of Emergency Physicians. There's a whole section of physicians that deal with large gathering medicine. Um, so... You know, I'm involved in that all the time in, in my professional life and in my corporate life. Um, that's what we do. And as part of that, we also do a lot of pandemic preparedness. 
We help our clients respond and, um, you know, in, with response and recovery um, to this large pandemic. Yeah. And of course, in the we very often are thinking ahead to um, crises and, and how that affects especially large populations, big events, uh, whenever there's a hurricane, a flood, whatever, um, and, and even just the impacts on water systems of large events and cells and tech. Uh, wastewater systems are typically sized according to the largest flushing event, which is the halftime at the Super Bowl. So. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and, you, and there are some folks that can predict how many people are actually watching the Super Bowl by the amount of wastewater usage during commercials. Nice. Although now the commercials have gotten really fun, that's changed a little bit. But uh, you know, now now producers are creating these amazing new commercials. So. Some people watch the game just for the commercials. Well, and of course, they can just take their phone with them in the bathroom. And they could, uh, nowadays, they can do that. So, um, okay, let's see. Uh, the reopening, uh, what is the stage reopening right now for uh, for New York City and New York State? And, and uh, also, uh, Governor Cuomo's announcement in terms of uh, self-isolation for people from other states now coming to New York City as opposed to before it was New York City going to other states. Right, isn't that interesting? So New York City, New Jersey, and Connecticut have done a really good job responding to the COVID-19 outbreak. So New York City and the surrounding areas were really hard hit in the early days. You can remember the numbers were particularly terrible here. And, you know, our, our outbreak, we think, started in the West Coast, perhaps, although there's been some question where it started, but um, the West Coast was the first news stories that we were seeing. And then New York quickly became the epicenter for the country. But now it's the, re so think back two months ago, mayor, governors in the South were saying, specifically in Florida, if you come to Florida from New York, you have to self-quarantine. Now the reverse is happening. So states in the South and the West are doing particularly terrible because they're not breaking the chain of infectivity um, in, with this virus. They're, they're, their governors are not, um, in my opinion, are not following the, the science and listening to their public health officials. Um, and they're opening their states very quickly, and you're seeing a big uptick in the numbers of cases. So now New York is probably one of the safest places to be. And the last thing that the governors of New York want to have happen, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, is have a large influx of people from the South coming in and bringing COVID back into New York. So um, I can understand why they would say that. It's a little problematic to implement those kind of policies, but in the United States, because people travel between states so easily. But um, I think it's in the right, the right idea is that you don't want to allow people that are infected to bring large numbers of infections back to the states that are doing particularly well. Absolutely, yeah. I was just really quickly, I'm looking at the tab trying to uh, uh, get the list of, do you, do you know offhand the list of the 10 states that have just been listed by uh, Governor Cuomo that are going to... No, I wrote about it in my newsletter. That's right, that's where I saw it. Okay. That's where you saw it. So it's um, uh, off the top of my head, no. Florida, Texas, Alabama, and don't hate me everybody on this call if I get it wrong, but... Uh, the Carolinas are on there, North Carolina. North South Carolina. Carolina, yeah. I see Alaska or was that Arkansas? I looked Arkansas. at it really. Oh, that was Arkansas. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, um, the, uh, I know you have another call coming up. The, um, and now that you said that, I think I put the wrong initials in. I think AK is, I think it is, uh, Alaska. Okay. Know, yeah. Alabama's AL. So I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, it's Arkansas. All right. All right. Well, you're, uh, so by the way, folks, Dr. Stu is, is mailing out updates every single day so you can get emailing, on emailing. E yes. yeah, emailing updates every single day and and i'm still looking for that meant to pull that up sorry about that well we'll, we'll get it for you guys tomorrow we're doing this one more time tomorrow or we on for is it 3 p.m tomorrow i think today's four o'clock today tomorrow's yeah you'll have to, we'll, you'll have to we'll have to we'll have to look at our calendars afterwards um, no problem okay uh next big hot spots which cities, not just the state, but what specific cities? Are we going to see another city with refrigerator trucks sitting outside of the hospitals and, and like that level of, of death rates coming up? So, you know, 
it, I don't have a crystal ball, and there are, but there are some models that look like Florida could become a big hotspot. Um, however, Miami has, you know, has taken a close look at that and has actually stopped their reopening. So there are cities that are that are actually, and and states, Texas has stopped their reopening. There's some news articles that people are following. So it's really hard to tell. Um, but I can tell you that states in the south and states in the in the in the sort of south central part of our country um, are not doing well with their case numbers. And although our overall death rate in the United States is it's not dropping anymore. For the last week it's been steady, but the models I looked at yesterday, it looks like if we don't get a hold of what's going on, we're gonna start seeing a spike, a rise in deaths come September. So the new models that I saw um, really looked like we're gonna continue along. We're now up to 30,000 new cases a day. It used to be 20,000. So our new cases are rising. Hospitals are getting full in, in parts of the country. Um, we haven't seen refrigerated trucks yet, but um, it comes September, if we haven't really uh, gotten a hold of this, we're going to start seeing problems again because the numbers, the projections look kind of upsetting come September. Right. And, and just to clarify again, the difference between cases increasing and, and hospitalizations and, and whether we should be not testing as much and we're not going to get pregnant if we don't do a pregnancy test and all that kind of like yeah, that. so that was a, yeah, so um, part of the breaking the chain of infectivity is to test as many people as you want, as you can. You want to catch asymptomatic people that are infectious, right? So there is a percentage, and we don't know that number because we're not doing enough testing, but we know already that there are a certain number of people like you and I that mm -hmm. have no symptoms. I feel great. But theoretically, I could be shedding COVID-19 out, the virus out of my mouth every time I talk. Right. I don't know because I don't have any symptoms. Unless you <laughs> test me, you can't tell that I am infectious and you can't tell me to stay home for two weeks. Because and, you and there are a lot of people who were, who were thinking that, that uh, you know, that, well, I probably already had it because I got really sick in February or whatever. Now, there the fact is there wasn't testing available on, on a bright wide basis and people were told don't use the test because we need it for older people and vulnerable populations and and healthcare workers and things like that right so so it wasn't accessible for some of the younger folks and now is accessible i mean when should people be thinking about getting a test well it varies in various states because as hard as it is to believe five or six months after this thing started, we still do not have widespread available uh, testing um, all throughout our 50 states. There is testing available everywhere now, but in some places it's still fairly short supply and they'll only test symptomatic people. The problem with that is you're missing the whole public health side of this. There's no way to get, a, to get our arms around stopping the chain of infectivity and slowing down the virus because we're not capturing the asymptomatic people because we're only testing in some parts of the country we're only testing symptomatic people right. so we're missing all those people that have it that don't have symptoms now asymptomatic does not mean that you're immune to it or that you're somehow you know, you're gonna, no, it does not. You're gonna show up it may show up later no it does not mean that it means yeah. that there are people this is a crafty virus Nice. There are some people whose bodies in which the virus grows, but it doesn't give them symptoms. And we don't understand exactly why that's possible. But with this virus, we know that some people, especially young people, can have an active infection and no symptoms. And that's the problem. Um, do we have time? We probably have time for like one more question. Um, cat and then ah, crap, crap, crap. Okay, so so big question. Okay, so we're focused on a lot of water leaders and or or civic leaders or leaders in their own local communities who you know business owners, um, you know, not just waiting for the politicians to make up their minds or or whatever. What can someone do if they are responsible? 
for reopening a business, for reopening an office, uh, for, for bringing their team back together. What can they do to protect their own team? What decisions can they make? Where can they get up-to-date information to decide for themselves, the, the crowds locally, their local communities that they're responsible for? Yeah, that's, so that's a very variable um, discussion because we, we know that the CDC and OSHA do employer, uh, the CDC does um, general health guidelines, OSHA puts out workforce guidelines. There are states that have guidelines out. People need to follow the, the state guidelines and the phases. Most states are doing some kind of phase reopening. Um, so it's a matter of following the news, following the data, the science, and I write about that in my newsletter. Your folk, the people listening to this can, can actually write to you, Kat, you can um, send me their names and I'll put them on the newsletter. So we write about the science and following CDC guidance is a, is a good idea. For and real if, and if, if choices that people are making themselves, if their offices say, you've got to come back to work today, um, people are saying, no, I'm not coming in. I'm working from home, no, no go. So should people say no? Can be uh, that's an individual choice. I can't really comment on that because it has to do with what state they're in, what the employer is doing to protect the employees, what the building looks like. That's a really individual question. So I can't really answer that in the broad, in, in sort of the broad terms that we're talking about. Especially when I ask you right at the end of the year. Uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> we have time. We have time tomorrow to talk again. Fantastic. Well, folks, if you have any questions, please send them to us. And, uh, and Stu, we'll meet you again with you one last time. And if you haven't signed up yet, watercitizen.org slash watercovidhomehealth. Um, send that out to your list uh, in your newsletter tomorrow, and hopefully we'll, we'll capture a few more folks to, to be part of the discussion. Take care, yeah. everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.